Okay, so hello everyone. I'm here with Alex Narasta. He is a uh, he works for the Cato Institute. Uh, has written tons of articles for Cato. He has a very good Substack that I'll that I link below. Uh, he's been called a one man factory uh, by Ann Coulter. Now she was referring to something about to producing bad studies or something, but she turned out to be wrong about the the empirical dispute about uh, the quality of the studies. So yeah, Alex, uh, thanks thanks so much for uh, for coming and chatting. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, so I mean, you're you're like the thing you're most known for is writing like roughly a one billion articles about why immigration is good and all the standard objections to immigration are are bunk. So I mean, just sort of lay out for for people who are ignorant, you know, what's so good about immigration? So there's a, there's a lot that's really good about immigration. The major point is that immigrants to the United States, and I focus mainly on the United States because every country has particular uh, different issues, but the big benefit is that uh, immigrants come from generally poorer countries. They come to the United States, they massively increase their wages and earning as a result of being here. According to research from uh, Michael Clemens and a few other uh, scholars, the, the median immigrant to the U.S. from a developing nation increases their uh, their income by about a factor of four, and that is taking account of the cost of living uh, increase in the United States. So that's a massive productivity gain that is mostly captured by the immigrant, but there are also positive spillovers for native-born Americans. So it's an economic exchange, primarily. That's the main reason why immigrants come to the United States and other rich countries. It benefits the immigrants. It benefits uh, native-born Americans. It benefits people who are left behind in the home countries where these people come from. And it benefits, uh, I think, the United States as a whole. So it's this large, mutually beneficial, voluntary exchange that is probably larger. And what I mean by that is like liberalizing immigration would do more to increase wealth in the world and productivity than any other like single um, liberalization um, of markets because the difference in prices and labor are so vast between countries. And, and why that matters is that, um, you know, the labor demand curve is determined by the productivity of the worker. And so by them moving to the United States, they become so much more productive, global production increases, and it's just this massive positive sum. And so it, that is, you know, in, in a nutshell, the major reason um, why immigration is beneficial and why I, I work on it. That's what really gets me up in the morning uh, to work on it. There are lots of other good, like ethical arguments and justifications from different perspectives. I, I don't disagree with those. And I, I agree with just about all of them. Um, but that's the one that gets me going. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, yeah, immigration is one of the few areas where there are like trillion dollar bills lying on the sidewalk. I mean, you know, Brian, you know, there's the, the thing by Clement or Clemens or Clement, whatever, uh, yeah, Clemens. where like very liberal immigration laws could like double global GDP or something. There are like no other areas where something could double the productivity of the world by just having one kind of law change. Um, yeah, Kaplan refers to it as not trickle down economics, but Niagara Falls economics, which, which I think was an amusing turn of phrase. Um, but so, you know, I mean, there are lots of concerns people have about immigration that you, you've argued are, are not well-founded. One of them that you argue is that people are worried that it's bad for wages, you know, that if, if immigrants come here and they uh, take low-wage jobs and compete against native workers, then uh, just as, you know, if there's if there's an increase in the, the supply of rice, then the price of rice will go down. If there's an increase in the supply of uh, workers, then the, the price of workers will go down. And so then, uh, you know, it'll, it'll depress workers as, you know, as Tucker Carlson uh, said famously, you know, libertarians they love supply and demand, except when it comes to uh, when it comes to to uh, labor. So, uh, what's wrong with this argument? Um, so, when you talk about that, yeah, like, I, I do love supply and demand. Uh, Tucker's argument there, he focuses just on supply and doesn't uh, notice demand. And so, uh, the difference is uh, compared to rice is that when you have more rice, like rice doesn't buy stuff. It's just a product. But immigrants are people, they buy things. So you have an increase in demand uh, that occurs. 
uh, because you have more people here. It's the same reason why, um, you know, having more uh, children, for instance, born in a country doesn't lead to eventual wage declines because they're just more workers, right? It's like you, you have workers who make things, who make goods and services. You have an increase in the supply of labor. On the other hand, you also have an increase in demand. And the sort of net effects of this uh, for, for other reasons that uh, go on in this, in this uh, situation anyway, but, but you have sort of a net increase in uh, wages, you know, just slightly for uh, native born Americans. And there's a bunch of different reasons for this. You know, one is um, there's really no such thing as like labor. Um, there are hundreds of thousands of different occupations. And so if a million tomato pickers move to the United States, they are not going to compete with like accountants and astrophysicists, right? And most Americans aren't tomato pickers and Americans change their jobs based on the wage competition in specific sectors. So Americans, if there's a million tomato pickers move into the United States, Americans who would have been tomato pickers instead say, okay, well, I'm going to get a little bit more education. I'm going to get a few more skills. I'm going to work in a different job. And what we find is, uh, especially in a place like the United States, which is a monolingual labor market for the most part, uh, almost overwhelmingly, um, just that ability to speak English as a native born American allows them to specialize in jobs of communication while low skilled immigrants specialize in jobs where manual labor is uh, more important. And what we know is that communication oriented jobs uh, are more highly compensated. So uh, the, the economy is not a zero sum game. It is not a fixed pie of jobs. There is no sort of lump of labor uh, out there that can be fulfilled. Um, and so having more people is good uh, for the economy, um, bluntly. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's some dispute among economists about the overall effect that it has on wages. You have some people thinking that it, it has a positive effect, even on low wages. Others like Borjas say that, you know, it'll, for, for very low wage earners, uh, that the, the very low wage earners, their wages will go down a little bit, but other people's wages will go up. Uh, can you give me a sense sort of like, what, what do economists generally think about the effect that it'll have on the, the wages of low wage workers? So uh, like in the Borjas research, so it's due to the methods that he uses in his paper. He uses a structural model where you assume a production function. And under this production function, basically um, an increase in uh, the number of the quantity of workers doesn't affect uh, total wages in the economy, but it shifts the relative wages between different groups by education status uh, or by, by level of education. So what he finds is that like the relative wages of high school dropouts who are about 10% of American adult workers, native born American adult workers, uh, would go down by about um, two percentage points. But that doesn't mean absolute decline in wages. That's just relative to other education groups like uh, high school only graduates or college graduates. Uh, meanwhile, he finds that the relative wages of immigrants because of more immigration uh, does go down compared to the wages of all native born Americans. So it's like very confusing in the way that this is presented and communicated in the public. And maybe I'm not doing a good job either talking about this, but you can have a situation and which is the situation we see where the relative wage growth of people who are high school dropouts is like lower than it otherwise would be because of immigration. But that doesn't mean that anybody's wages actually go down. And that's pretty much what we see right here. And then the results of Borjas's work and, and, and other economists in this find that immigrants just don't compete that much with native born Americans because they, they have different skills, different language abilities. They move to different parts of the country. Americans change their behavior in the labor market in response to immigrants being here. So what's interesting is almost all of the real competition you see in the labor market as a result of immigrants coming here is between new immigrants and immigrants that arrived in the recent past. So that's where like, if you find any overall negative wage effects, that's almost entirely where they're concentrated is amongst immigrants competing with each other. Now, even if you take a look at those, of course, you're talking about very small single digit declines in wages compared to multiple hundreds of percent increases in wages by merely coming um, to the United States. So the, the wage literature gets a little like misrepresented, sort of misportrayed. Uh, and that's merely because of this sort of arcane methods of economists who are very poor at communicating their actual findings. Yeah. So, so like, 
if you had to guess, would your would your sense be that sort of like most economists would expect that low wage workers that their uh, relative purchasing power would go up as a result of more immigrants, or would go down, or stay about the same? Um, stay about stay about the same, basically plus or minus two percent. Um, now this doesn't. This is of course like a broad average based on education groups. You could have certainly some occupations where uh, the wages go down. There's like um, you know uh, inelastic um, like labor demand in some occupations. So you could see like a supply and lay uh, of of uh, uh, increase in workers sort of drive down wages there. But in a lot of other low wage occupations, you won't see any decline, and some you'll see an increase. But the overall effect is roughly about zero, slightly positive overall for all Americans, but close to zero. I mean, it's just not the market that is actually the most affected by immigration. The market that is most affected is actually the market for real estate. (laughs) So um, to give you like an estimate of this, um, sort of the most negative wage findings on uh, the economics of immigration is that a 1% increase in the population will lower uh, wages by about 0.2%. It's about the most negative type of finding you'll find, pretty typical. But you'll find like an increase in the population of 1% due to immigration will increase rents by 1%. So it is a sort of dramatically larger difference is is real estate. And you don't really see this debate much in the United States. Uh, Sometimes J.D. Vance will bring it up, but you do see it in other places like uh, Canada and the United Kingdom where people will be opposed to immigration uh, because of the effect on uh, rents. Yeah. Wait, so do you think, so what do you make of this? Well, so I guess, what do you make of this argument against immigration? That immigration raises what raises rents by making there be more people. Uh, and so then things are, are more expensive. Uh, yeah, I mean, that 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 is, um, I, I don't disagree. I mean, that is the economic effect, right? Um, but what I would say is that um, there's another factor that increases uh, rents and the price of real estate, and that is uh, land use restrictions, other supply restrictions. Uh, immigrants do increase the demand more than they increase the supply of workers who work in construction, but they also increase the supply of housing a bit by you know, having more productive capacity to expand housing. Uh, but I would say that uh, it also results in a more efficient allocation of scarce resources, which is land, which is, which is a scarce resource that's very valuable. So I want to say like, if you have an economic argument that is just focused on sort of core microeconomics, um, the, it drives up the price of real estate is probably the most sound. Now, of course, that means since native born Americans own almost all the real estate in the United States, that immigration also increases massively the wealth of Americans, including a lot of, uh, poor and middle-class Americans. So it is in a way, this sort of, uh, redistribution scheme to aid a lot of Americans who already own uh, real estate, but it's also a self-regulating mechanism. If it becomes too expensive to live in the United States because rents go up so high, um, then that means there's going to be a point where, um, even if there are these massive wage gains for immigrants to come here, um, that it won't be worth it at some point, but that's what we would expect from economics. That's what the market should do, um, to allocate scarce resources to where they're most highly valued. Yeah. I mean, the other thing is that like, I think I, I would I would expect I would agree with you that it would it'll probably raise rents, but like the the if you compare the magnitude of like just dramatically bettering the quality of life of huge numbers of people, increasing productivity, spurring huge amounts of immigration as a large amount of or sorry innovation as a large amount of I- innovation comes from immigrants or the children of immigrants. Like if if a person took this argument too seriously, they should just be like an anti natalist and be against having kids at all, right? Because you know. If no one had kids, rents would be very cheap. Um, uh, you know, if there were ha- you know, if there were fifty million people in America, uh, housing would be would be extremely cheap. But nonetheless, we think you know that the benefits of, of more people being created is sufficiently large that we shouldn't dis disincentivize people having kids. And I think some more. Things, uh, no, I, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, the thing is, like, if you have a more prosperous society, almost everything gets more expensive. So. Uh, 
but that's not an argument for not being prosperous and rich, right? Um, or it's not a good argument in my mind. I mean, you know, real estate is very cheap in Zambia, um, but part of it is because nobody wants to live there uh, and they would all leave if they could. And it's very poor. So we want, um, it, it, it's generally the sign of like a healthy place where like Houston, Texas, right? Which has no zoning uh, laws on the books to restrict supply, but housing prices are still going up there because it's a very desirable place to live. Um, meanwhile, in a place like Detroit, for a long time, it was not a very desirable place to live. Not many people were moving there, and lots of houses were so um, cheap that they were abandoned. Uh, that's not a good result either, right? So we want places where people want to live, and places where people want to live are worth paying for. Um, so it's it, it is an argument, right? Like you, you do have like this somewhat negative uh, argument where uh, Keteris Paribus, you know, more people moving to a place means uh, higher rents. But that's also like a mark of success. It's a mark of uh, people want to be there. Uh, the United States is a great country, and uh, we should be happy that people want to move and give up the cultures they grew up in to come to the United States and make us more prosperous in turn. Yeah, it is amusing how just a lot of the arguments against immigration are such that if a person took them seriously as applied to other contexts, they would just justify being opposed to like people having kids, right? Like Ooh. if you know, oh, you know, you shouldn't allow poor people to have kids because they'll compete with with the already born poor people who have kids and, you know, it'll drive down wages. Or, you know, the, these new people who are after they're born, they might commit crimes, but, you know, we, we, don't, we don't take those very seriously. So another worry that, that people raise is, is known as brain drain, where the idea is, you know, all the all the smart people from India and China are going to come and, and Zambia are going to come to the United States. And then India and China and Zambia will have no smart people and they'll be poor because they're devoid because, you know, all the smart people are gone. Um, what do you make of this worry? Uh, so I, I just don't take it that seriously. Um, for one thing, uh, there, there are basically like two groups of people who make this argument. One is uh, third world nationalists who um, actually really believe it. And I think they're just suffering from really bad um, economic uh, arguments. Um, for one thing, the ability, if you're uh, somebody who lives in the third world, developing world, uh, one of the few ways that you can successfully leave is by getting a large amount of skills that are very valuable. And by gaining those skills, you give a large incentive for people to increase their human capital and their productivity. And not everybody who gets those skills um, is going to leave. So there's some productivity spillovers in that term. Another one is that the immigrants who come to developing countries, or sorry, to developed countries, uh, they send back home remittances uh, to the countries that they came from. So they sort of, these countries, we think about in an international trade model sense, they export labor and then they import capital. Um, the other thing is that a lot of, and this is the theory that I subscribe to about uh, why some countries are poor and others are rich, is that uh, developed country is a better economic institution. They respect private property, contract rights, they're not dictatorships, they're relatively safe. And so, um, while poor countries don't have those. So people come here from developing countries, they learn somewhat how the way things work, they think it works pretty well, and they communicate that either back to their friends and family back home, or they eventually go back home. And as a result of that, there's positive changes in the institutions in their home countries. And there's a good amount um, of evidence for that. And then the other one is you have these immigrants. A lot of them are very smart, productive, motivated people. They're stuck in these poor countries by being able to come to the United States or another rich country, they're actually free to innovate. They can innovate a lot more. They can create new ideas, new technologies, new processes. As a result of these being invented here, um, they also go back to the third world or their home countries in terms of new products and new processes that make everybody richer. So like my favorite example of this is Elon Musk. If he had stayed in South Africa, the chances of him sort of revolutionizing um, uh, electric car, electric vehicles, um, lowering the price of rockets, uh, working, um, you know, with like, um, what was it? PayPal electronic payments. Like uh, he just probably, probably would not have been able to do any of that in South Africa. Right. But now South Africans have access to, uh, Tesla's and cheaper satellite communications and, uh, PayPal, like the rest of us, because he was able to leave and uh, innovate and make those things um, in the United States. 
And then, of course, the, the other last way is by just returning. And a lot of immigrants do return back to their home countries uh, at different times for, for opportunities or because they miss their families or they want to retire there, etc. When they return, they bring that human capital with them. And oftentimes they start businesses, um, a lot of uh, Indian technology firms, for instance, that are big in India, uh, were started by uh, Indian immigrants uh, who came to the United States, learned a lot about how Americans manage firms, um, and then went back to, to India and started that. And there's a lot of evidence that one of the great, Amer I think Americans are on average good at a, a great many things, but I think the thing that we're probably the best at compared to other places is management like management science, having to run large organizations. And, and there's a lot of research that a lot of firms like in developing countries and either even in Europe are just like pretty poorly managed. And there's a lot of profit opportunity being left on the table. So there's bringing those skills back to these countries and improving management by just a little bit has huge returns. So, and then the, the other argument, I think that brain drainers, the other group of brain drainers are, I think, um, largely, um, I don't want to say they're liars, but they're like disingenuous in the sense where I just actually don't think they care about the third rule at all. They just want to make a sort of like woke sounding argument <laughs> about why immigration is bad. Yeah, it, it is funny how, you know, a lot of the people who claim to be very concerned about brain drain, you'll like, like you'll be, you'll be talking about immigration. They'll be like, yeah, it's great for the immigrants, but you know, it's not good for America. And that's what we should care about. And then they just immediately pivot to just being like, no, you know, the real harm of immigration is, you know, how bad it is for, uh, the, the, you know, the, these poor countries. I mean, yeah, I think, I think it's very clear that most of the people who talk about brain drain, just like they don't actually care that much about brain drain, but basically they, you know, they just want sort of like, you know, to say, and it's not even good from the perspective of the countries that are immigrating, even though, yeah, I, I, I think, yeah, I mean, I think what, what you said was all, all very convincing, especially, I mean, the remittances point, I think that just decimates the brain drain case, something like, and I, I looked at this, you know, a few years ago, but as of like 2017, like, I think it was 27% of the GDP of developing countries that comes from remittances. I mean, remittances provide this really extraordinary, uh, this really extraordinary, really positive effect. Uh, which is unsurprising when people come and their wages are 10 times higher. They have a lot more money that they can send back home. Um, yeah, I think it was um, like in 2022, it was um, $626 billion in remittances to poor yeah. and middle income countries, which is just dramatic. And, and unlike foreign aid, which does not have a good track record of uh, success, um, this is money that goes into the pockets of the family members of the immigrants who are left there. Right. Um, so it actually goes into people's pockets and they know uh, a little bit better what they could use money for rather than a lot of foreign aid, which it's not all worthless, right? But a lot of it is just basically burnt by sending it to third world autocrats who put it in bank accounts or have other political incentives to spend the money in ways that are not uh, conducive to uh, improving uh, economic growth and development in the most efficient way possible. And like, you know, I think it was uh, Bill Easterly wrote in the early 2000s about the like roughly trillion dollars that had been spent on international development aid by the year 2000 or so and how it had like basically no effect. Uh, and basically, this is a lot more money being sent in total through minces that has a lot bigger impact. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I would I would disagree a bit about uh, economic development, like, for example, like, like the, the smallpox eradication programs have saved something like tens of millions of lives. I think, like, maybe the median thing of economic aid isn't that valuable. But I think some of them are just like so valuable that that overall, it's worth it. But you know, that's sort of uh, that that's a, a um, yeah, I mean, I think you can make like a, a certain right. I, I think it's good to like think about the margin of some of these uh, programs. So I think like uh, smallpox is eradication is probably uh, the best uh, argument. It's sort of a World Health Organization uh, argument or a program that was uh, completed by the late 70s. But you take a look at things like uh, development assistance by increasing the amount of um, like investment in developing countries by sending them like capital goods or, or other health interventions that didn't really have an effect. Um, and I think it's pretty clear, like the marginal dollar is not very, uh, useful, at least historically. I know there's some more recent research that, 
that contradicts some of that, uh, especially at the random control trial literature on this. Um, but I think that if I were to take all that money, let's say cancel all foreign aid and replace it with increasing the scale of just temporary migration by, let's say, 10 percent, uh, I think that would be like an unambiguous like exchange worth it. Yeah, I, I think so, too. But I, I think, yeah, that, that shows the, the benefits of immigration. But yeah, I, I think I'd be, be inclined to, uh, to to think foreign aid is generally uh, is generally a positive. So I, I know there there's a lot of disagreement about it, it that I, I haven't looked into that carefully, but just sort of my, my sense of, from looking into it a bit. Um, so in your view, OK, who is the most convincing critic of immigration? Um, like whose arguments do you find the most persuasive? So I'll tell you about sort of the general argument that I find potentially the most persuasive, and then I'll sort of dig into uh, some of the people who made this argument. So um, I think the 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 best argument is this sort of institutional argument, which is that the United States and other developed countries are wealthy because we have better economic and political institutions, which is just like a fancy word for uh, rules and their enforcement mechanisms. So like prior property, free markets, um, relative democracy, things like that. Uh, these incentivize and create incentives for people to be productive because they can capture a large percentage of their extra production. So if you and I, if we double our incomes, uh, you know, the government's going to get a piece of that um, and we may be robbed. Uh, but we're going to keep the most of it, right? So we have a good incentive to work hard and to be responsible and to increase our human capital and to start businesses, et cetera. Uh, but de uh, developing countries have worse institutions and most immigrants come from these developing countries. So the fear is that if we allow in a lot more immigrants to the United States, for instance, from these countries, they will somehow bring these institutions with them. They either through, through voting or through affecting American culture, or by making um, uh, Americans less willing to do business, or through some other kind of mechanism that is maybe unknown, um, basically make us less productive to the extent where this goose that lays the golden eggs of economic growth uh, gets killed. And that would be a tragedy for um, our species. Uh, because economic growth has not happened a whole lot in human history, and it's pretty awesome, and we should have more of it, and we should be wary of doing things that, that would undermine it. Um, I wrote an entire book with Benjamin Powell about this argument, because I find this argument potentially the most persuasive. If I were convinced that immigrants to the United States had a very good chance, or a pretty good chance, of undermining our economic institutions and killing economic growth, then I would be opposed um, to immigration or I would want to restrict it in some way. Maybe not like closed borders, but want to restrict it um, considerably. So I wrote a whole book about this and basically was the first scholar along with a few other co-authors uh, to write about this institutional argument uh, in peer-reviewed academic literature and blog posts and books, et cetera, sort of started this. And what we basically found is like, there's actually more argument that immigration increases the quality of economic institutions in places where they go than there is evidence that they diminish them, diminish their quality. Um, and I, I can go into some of the literature if you want, but we've got quasi natural experiments. We've got like um, cross sectional analysis. We've got some uh, very sloppy time series which I don't really buy, but they're um, suggestive. Uh, we've got um, uh, some good like qualitative work that is done on this. And um, it's pretty darn convincing, frankly, um, that immigrants at worst have no effect on institutions in the places where they go and at best may actually improve them slightly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with you that this is sort of like the, the best argument against immigration, because even though I, I don't think it's right, it's the one that is such that if it were right, it could be enough to uh, outweigh the potentially trillion dollars worth of benefits of immigration. Like, 
suppose immigrants did slightly boost to the crime rate, which I, I don't think they do. I think they, you know, as, as you've convincingly argued, I think they lower it. But, but even if they did slightly boost the crime rate, like, I, I think immigration would still be an unambiguous, enormous benefit. Uh, uh, and but I mean, when it comes to to this one, if it if it really was true that, as Kara Jones, for example, suggests that America that that lots of immigration would make the United States a lot more like you know poor countries with terrible institutions, that would I think you know be enough to outweigh the, the enormous benefits of immigration. So um, yeah, so so do you want to explain just briefly? So like what? you know, what, why, how do we know that immigrants don't have a deleterious effect on institutions? Um, wouldn't, wouldn't we sort of expect, you know, if, if lots of people from Venezuela are coming to the United States, wouldn't they import Venezuelan institutions by, you know, voting for Venezuelan institutions? Yeah. So uh, one of the things to recognize, I think, in, in every subtopic of immigration is that the immigrants who leave a country are not like a random selection of, of people from that country. Right. The people who leave are usually self-selected. They usually are more cosmopolitan. They don't mind living in a place with a different culture. They are usually a little bit more ambitious and motivated, things that are difficult to measure. Um, on paper. And they're usually people who aren't too enamored with the culture or institutions of the places uh, where they come from. And I think especially in the case of uh, Venezuela, you have people who have experienced an authoritarian socialist uh, country collapse and uh, want to leave and go to the United States in the same way that a lot of Cubans uh, in the United States uh, fled a communist dictatorship to come here. They're not voting for the uh, you know Communist Party of the USA when they get here they're actually mostly Republicans uh, because they're coded as the uh, the anti-communist party um, in the United States so it's not like there's some kind of um, I just don't think there's a lot of good evidence that there's like some kind of innate naturalistic or like genetic on like an ethnic group level like genetic predisposition to vote for socialism or or capitalism to that great of an extent. Um, that this like travels and migrates um, across borders. So some of the other evidence that we see, of course, is some great quasi-natural experiments uh, in other countries. So we saw uh, like in Israel, for instance, in the fall of the Soviet Union, because Israel has this right of return uh, for Jews around the world, I'd go there is the entire reason why Israel was uh, created after the Holocaust. And so when the Soviet Union collapsed, their population increased by about 20% in five years uh, from Soviet Jews going uh, to Israel, many of whom, of course, were not religious or many generations removed from religious people, but they have the opportunity to leave a uh, corrupt, collapsing communist country to go to, to Israel. And what we saw was on this measure of economic freedom that uh, the Cato Institute puts together with, along with the Fraser Institute, that Israel goes from looking like a sort of normal Middle Eastern country with pretty mediocre economic institutions in uh, 1990 to looking like an OECD country with Western style economic institutions a decade later. And when you dig into a lot of the qualitative research of what was going on, it was a lot of these political parties and the Russian immigrants themselves who voted for sort of more free market parties, voted for more and better economic institutions. And then people in Israel saying, hey, we've got this big population increase. We've got some economic problems. We need to liberalize to make sure these people all get jobs uh, in the economy. Uh, so that's like one good quasi-natural experiment. Another one is in Israel uh, and Jordan, which um, coincidentally at the same time, uh, there was this large population of Palestinians who were living in Kuwait when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. Um, basically, all the Palestinians got kicked out of Kuwait um, during the Gulf War. And uh, due to this quirk of Jordanian law, they could all go to Jordan and uh, vote immediately. <laughs> and basically, you had a 10% increase or so in Jordan's population in the course of a year. And what you saw was a rapid liberalization. Um, and it was because of the migrants um, for, for a whole host of reasons. And then we take a look at sort of this cross-sectional data um, of uh, changes in the economic freedom score of countries across the world due to increases in immigration over time. And what we find is that more immigration leads to more uh, reforms and increases in uh, prior property rights and free markets and the quality of uh, economic institutions um, across the world. Uh, so... Um, and then there's like a good amount of like evidence from the 19th and, and 20th century in the United States that's more sort of um, 
not as like hard empirical because we don't have great data uh, from back then about like the quality of economic institutions. But uh, the data that we do have are consistent with this, that when uh, the United States borders were relatively open, you had um, slower growth in uh, regulations and government expenditures and the size of government. And that's not the only thing that matters in economic freedom, of course, uh, but they're correlated uh, with each other on these indices. So the notion that like immigrants go to a place and then all of a sudden you get a lot worse economic institutions is just not borne out. Uh, and the evidence uh, across countries over time, across countries uh, over time within countries or in these uh, quasi natural experiments. Uh, one of the counter arguments people say is, well, look at California. Uh, and I'm a Californian, I'm from there originally. Um, and you see this sort of shift in the 1990s where California goes from a you know, relatively purplish state to a pretty deep blue state. And people say, oh, it must be because of the immigrants. And uh, they are right to the extent that the Republican Party declared war on immigrants in the 1990s and turned them all off. Uh, but you also have several other states in the United States, like Texas and Florida and Arizona, which have gotten a large number of immigrants and have become uh, more Republican. Not that being Republican is that consistent with being free market state. The, the difference in the political parties on this is pretty small. Um, but there's just a lot of just so stories out there that just don't hold up under empirical scrutiny. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm inclined to agree that I think, yeah, I was kind of surprised because I, I sort of expected the evidence surrounding whether it undermines institutions to be sort of unclear. But yeah, I was surprised just the extent to which we just have all these like natural experiments looking at both states, looking at, at countries, looking at, uh, at these uh, in cases where countries have just taken in huge numbers of immigrants and their institutions have gotten better. And it just seems like the sort of like Jones thesis is just, just is, isn't borne out by the facts. Um, so on, on the subject of Jones, so, uh, I mean, you, you wrote a long piece criticizing his book, The Culture Transplant, where, where he makes this case in some detail. Um, and he, he wrote a brief response to the piece so one criticism that he raised is, so in your piece, you cite uh, Kaplan's regression, where what Kaplan argues is even if we, so Joan, Joan says that there are, uh, that there are three, um, that there's what he calls the SAT score, which looks at three separate metrics. Uh, uh, and Jones argues that the SAT score of a, it looks at metrics for like how long the people who have been in an area have had a state, for example. So state history is one of them. Um, uh, and so he says that the SAT score quite well predicts the prosperity of a nation. And so then if we're getting huge numbers of people from low SAT score countries, not SAT in the like standardized aptitude test sense, yeah. but uh, the, the, his specialized SAT score, uh, then we would expect it to to make America poorer and to degrade the quality of our institutions. Um, and so, you know, uh, and you, you in response to this, one thing that you note is you cite Kapl Brian Kaplan's regression, where he says, you know, even if, even if this is all right, it would still end up supporting about two thirds of immigrants, open borders for about two thirds of countries, which have a higher SAT score uh, than than we do. So what Jones said in response to this is he says that the Kaplan's regression, it didn't take into account, uh, I think, I think it was state history. Um, and, uh, it, it, sorry, it, it doesn't it take into account the third one, which is history of technology, which is the most important bit. And when you do, then the result no longer holds up. It, so to, to what extent is, is this criticism, right? So, I mean, I did my own um, a look about this. So I combined like the global population figures from 2021 uh, with Jones appendix shows that 40 countries with a population total of uh, 2.8 billion people have a higher SAT asterisk score, which is his special score uh, than the United States, uh, including uh, developing countries like China, Brazil, Vietnam, Russia, etc. Um, and that's a very lots about 40 percent of the global population um what having you, what, uh, what did you say was the number it's about uh 40 percent of the global population okay live in living countries that have a higher sat score um than the um united states so 
using his preferred metric, right? Um, and, and you can use like other v- versions of this metric, but you have like a large number of countries uh, where this would work. And that would be a radical liberalization to do that. So I think like uh, Jones, like unwittingly, uh, and he sort of plays this thing where sometimes he's like, I'm not making policy recommendations. And then he makes like policy recommendations and whatever. Uh, but if, if we're taking it seriously as like a policy guide, um, it, I think Brian's point is generally correct. Maybe the exact number isn't exactly correct, right? About the percentage of the world that should have free migration with the United States. Um, but large numbers of countries, uh, it argues for a massive liberalization of immigration with these countries. And I think it's also like a pretty silly way to take a look at, um, you know, the SAT score development. I mean, one of the things is he writes this entire chapter in his book about Argentina. And he claims that Argentina, which had a lot of Italian immigration in the early 20th century, went from a very prosperous, wealthy country, one of the wealthiest countries in the world, to a very poor, economically dysfunctional country because of immigrants voting for bad candidates and changing economic institutions. Well, the funny thing is the source of immigrants to Argentina from Italy and Spain, those countries had a higher SAT score and even the SAT asterisk score according to Jones, um, than Argentina did. So I don't understand like his model of, of how this actually works. And he doesn't really have a model either. He sort of hints at some mechanisms that could explain this. And one of them he talks about is this sort of generalized social trust, like immigrants come in and they lower trust. And as a result of lower trust, through some mechanism, like additional mechanism, you get less economic growth in these developed countries. But trust is, you know, I wrote a whole academic paper about this. It's not very good. So Jones is a great writer. He's a smart guy. Um, I think it's worth taking a lot of his points seriously. But I also just don't think he did a lot of his homework. He didn't contend with the massive literature, peer-reviewed academic literature, on the effects of immigration on these institutions. And I think he needs to go back and uh, read that literature uh, and respond actually in writing uh, to what uh, I and other uh, economists have written um, about his work. I'd love to see what he has to say in response to that. I would love to know um, if I'm wrong about this because I would like to change my opinion before before I get too old. Yeah, so the one other criticism he, ra- he raised, so uh, one of the pieces that you cited in your your piece was a, a study by Clemens and Pritchett, uh, and th- you they you were trying to show with with their you cited them I think to show that even if even if immigration did have some negative effect on institutions, uh, that the positive benefits are sufficiently great that like based on sort of conservative assumptions, even if they did slightly undermine institutions, then immigration would still be positive. Now, Jones says that the the Clemens and Pritchett study, it, it doesn't, it, it assumes rather than proves that uh, immigrants don't don't uh, undermine institutions. So to what extent is this, is this criticism uh, true? I think it's ma- uh, largely uh, overblown. I mean, Clemens in their paper and, and Pritchett, uh, they sort of build this... Um, SIR model where they assume that bad institutions are like a disease that are carried by immigrants. And there is an extent to which immigrants assimilate into the institutional dynamics of the country where they go to. But there is a point where it's sort of infectious and it can infect these institutions. And, uh, you know, just assuming that they migrate uh, with their taking a look at their model, you would have to have like immigration um, many, many, many times higher than what it currently is. Uh, to get that kind of sort of negative spillover effect, even assuming like a very low rate of, of assimilation. I actually used this as part of a paper with two colleagues where we took a look at the economic freedom score in American states because American states have um, vastly different immigrant populations from vastly different parts of the world. So we have like, and, and American states have a lot of control over the amount of, uh, or the quality of their own economic institutions. So we wanted to see if there was this, some kind of effect where there's some kind of like convergence between um, American states and the economic freedom in um, countries uh, where they come from. And uh, what we found actually was that there, uh, in, in recent years anyway, um, 
states that had more immigration had more improvements in economic freedom. So there's more of a divergence rather than a convergence in these places that we found. So it was just like, Jones makes a lot of arguments and he doesn't really have many much empirical evidence um, to prove them. They're interesting arguments. I, I think that he should um, go and build like a formal model, uh, gather um, the empirical evidence so that uh, we can test this. I'd love to see the that the framework that he comes up with because this is an important issue to, to try to resolve. But I am unconvinced by his um, his arguments. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I, I agree with your assessment. Uh, I mean, one other one other thing. So Jones has multiple books that can be and seen in some ways arguing against immigration. You've argued against that that the point he makes in, in the culture transplant is not convincing. But he has he has another book called uh, Hive Mind, where what he argues is basically that one thing that determines how well a country goes by that, that, that's a pretty good determinant of uh, the prosperity in the country is the average IQ in that country. You know, the average IQ in a lot of low income countries is pretty low. The average IQ in the United States is pretty high. And so uh, Jones, I think, worries that immigrants uh, come here and they have lower IQs on average. And so on account of their lower IQs on average, uh, that they might sort of either undermine the quality of our institutions or just, you know, make things worse on account of their low IQs. So what do you make of this worry? So I don't think he's right about the institutional argument or that institutional mechanism. Uh, the, the other potential mechanism is that, you know, IQ is really like the secret sauce behind total factor productivity and other productivity gains. Um, and, and that, and that, you know, uh, may be true. Uh, but I also think that um, a lot of low skilled immigrants make it easier for high skilled Americans to be more productive on the job by having an increased division of labor. So instead of having to do, you know, spend more time on menial tasks, like having to clean your house, uh, you can have hire somebody else to do it. And then you can spend a little bit more time working and focusing on problems like that. So I just don't, um, I, I just don't buy his sort of argument um, about that. I don't think you see like a decrease in economic growth in places like California due to more um, you know, immigration, uh, even, even low skilled immigration. I think there's a lot of argument that for instance, like in a place like the Bay area in California, which is a very expensive area to live largely because of zoning and land use ordinances. So having more productive people there is a great gain to technological, uh, innovation, which increases productivity having, uh, but some parts of the Bay area have like really, really high crime. And what happened was low skilled immigrants moved into some of these areas. Uh, they have a much lower crime rate than some high crime native born Americans uh, forced them out. It made a large parts of the Bay Area livable. Native born Americans and other high skilled immigrants moved in these areas, lowering the price of uh, real estate by doing this. We're able to move in there, increase the population. And then you had more people be able to work and innovate and build things in uh, Silicon Valley. So I just um, I. I, I think that Garrett has done some very interesting research on um, intelligence and the role of IQ and productivity um, and things like that. But the notion that like if my neighbor has a lower IQ than me, that makes everybody like less productive, I think has a lot more, a lot less going for it than it seems. And he needs to connect more of the dots um, about this. I mean, just having more people in general, if you have like, 10 immigrants and you know seven of them are below average iq for the united states but three of them are above average uh iq for the united states well we've got more smart people who are here working so it's not like just ha immigration is like all low skilled low iq people a lot of smart people who are trapped in the third world um, who would come here and be very innovative. So I think even if you bought his story entirely, it's not a good argument because of the um, division of labor and because of the number of smart people who are trapped in poverty in, in poor countries with bad institutions. Yeah, I, I also think like if his argument were right, then we would expect immigrants to like innovate less. And then, but if as you've written about, if, if you look at the relevant, relative innovation between immigrants and non-immigrants, Immigrants tend to innovate more than non-immigrants. Some huge portion of patents are from either immigrants or the children of immigrants. Uh, and so 
you know, for that for that reason, it would be expected to to boost productivity. Yeah, I mean, but, I think what Jones is, I think what Jones would say in response to that, and I think he'd he'd have like a a solid point is that you know it's. Um, a lot of the innovations come from a relatively small set of uh, immigrants, you know, uh, who, are, who are relatively high skilled. So I think Jones, Jones does support like expanding high skilled immigration. Uh, but then I would counter by saying, hey, a lot of those immigrants who are really innovative uh, come from India, which is not known as an innovative country. Um, and, and, yeah. and they come here and they're allowed that they're capable of being more innovative. Right. So there are lots of people that there are a good number of people like Nigeria and India, Brazil, places that aren't known for their innovation. They're trapped in these poor institutions and by being able to come to the United States, they become much more innovative, right? That doesn't mean like your median, you know, your average Guatemalan immigrant is not going to be patenting a lot um, of stuff, uh, but um, they're not going to make the Indian immigrant who's very high skilled, less innovative um, because of deliver division of labor and comparative advantage. So I, I think, it's just not that um, that convincing to me. I live in a pretty diverse uh, neighborhood, people from all over the world, and a town that is very diverse, a lot of low-skilled people, a lot of high-skilled people. And I don't think people are less productive because you know the neighborhood over has some lower-skilled people. I think there's a good division of labor, and everybody benefits as a result. Yeah. So one other concern that many people, including leading immigration expert Ann Coulter, have raised about, <laughs> immigra about immigration is they think, you know, immigrants, they, they commit all these crimes, uh, you know, and, uh, and, and, and terror attacks. Uh, what do you make of this worry that immigrants are, are committing lots of crimes and terror attacks? So uh, this is very dependent upon the country that you're, uh, you're studying. Uh, but in the United States, um, immigrants have a far lower crime rate than native born Americans. Even illegal immigrants have a lower criminal conviction rate and crime rate than um, native born Americans. Now, um, Anne has some uh, a really good comment, actually, in her book, Adios America, which and, and I'm not being sarcastic when I say this, but I learned more from that book about immigration than almost any other book I've read. And what I mean by that is I learned how nativists think about immigration. And it was super insightful. And, but one of the things she has in this book is a, um, a, a great section where she says, the US government collects all this data on like the number of pigs on American farms, how many types of radios are owned by these people, right? But we don't have great data on uh, illegal immigrant criminals. What's going on here? And she's right in 49 out of 50 American states. There's not good data. But there's one state that does keep this data. And it's probably the best state in order to study. It's the state of Texas. And uh, I discovered um, that they kept this data and was the first to publish these reports about illegal immigrant, legal immigrant, the native-born American criminal conviction rates and arrest rates by crime and focusing on homicide, which is the most serious crime and the one where the data are the highest quality, we um, see that illegal immigrants have a criminal conviction rate for homicide that is 26% below that of native born Americans. And legal immigrants have a homicide conviction rate over 60% below that of native born Americans. Now, part of this, of course, is that like, immigrants do have a, a lower crime rate through self-selection, but also filtering in the legal immigration process. And because the punishments are so much harsher for them, if they get caught committing a crime, they also get deported in addition to incarceration. Uh, but also, um, you know, the, the, the reason is that Americans just have a really high crime rate. We really like committing crimes in the United States. It's really terrible. And so, uh, we're pretty bad and the immigrants are pretty good. Now in Europe, uh, for immigrants outside the EU, I think that's flipped, but it's mainly flipped because native born Europeans have such a low crime rate. If the immigrants in Europe came to the United States, they'd have a criminal conviction rate and crime rate far below that of native born Americans, right? So this matters considerably in terms of terrorism. Uh, so, so the crime stuff, you know, it matters. I think we should try to exclude criminals from the United States. I think we should punish them if they get caught committing crimes, all that stuff. Um, but it's just not a serious threat. They actually lower the overall crime rate because of this. And something that's like politically kind of incorrect and sensitive to talk about, but needs to be said is um, 
the vast majority of the victims of illegal immigrant crimes are other illegal immigrants. So that doesn't make the severity of their crime, you know, ethically less serious, of course. Uh, but it does mean that most of the victims are not native born Americans. So if you're coming at it from a nationalist perspective of like a blood and soil and blood and dirt thing, like Ann Coulter is really, um, you should actually see that the, the cost of crime are actually a lot smaller um, than she would think just from her perspective because of that. Um, on terrorism, um, the annual chance of being murdered in a foreign born terrorist attack in the U.S. soil is about one in four and a half million per year. Um, that's very small. There have been since 9-11 an average of two people killed on U.S. soil per year committed by a, on, in a terrorist attack by a foreigner. So you're just talking about super small numbers. Your annual chance of being murdered in a normal homicide, nothing to do with terrorism, just a normal homicide is 323 times greater. So over the, over the last 50 years, and that includes 9-11 which is the largest terrorist attack in world history by a factor of nine. So um, the terrorism argument is just not that serious to me. Um, it, terrorism is very rare. Most terrorists don't kill anybody in their attacks. They're pretty stupid. They're pretty incompetent. And so that is just not a very good argument, I think, for um, having uh, closed border uh, or immigration restrictions. But I think it is as an argument for some security checks to weed out some people who may be terrorists, but it's not an argument for blanket bans or closing the border or um, not restricting um, immigration. Yeah, it was amusing in your uh, congressional testimony, I think, when Chip, when you made this point and Chip Roy started yelling at you about how, you know, I'm sure the statistical unlikelihood is great comfort to the families of the people who were killed, um, which is a very silly thing to say. <laughs> It, it, it is silly, right? And, um, you know, I mean, like, you know, people are killed by weird things all the time, right? That are very rare. And to tell them or the survivors, you know, their family members, like, hey, that was really rare. Of course, like, that won't comfort the person who has been harmed. We can't expect it to, right? Um, but when we're talking about public policy and allocating trillions of dollars of uh, goods and services to um, their most efficient uses, we have to study these things because otherwise we're going to end up killing many, many, many more people. So like since 9-11, the U.S. has domestically spent about $2 trillion in counterterrorism. That doesn't include the opportunity cost of immigration restrictions, doesn't include the wars, doesn't include the decrease in civil liberties or anything like that, just $2 trillion. Assuming a value of statistical life of $25 million per life saved, that amount of money would have to have saved about 80,000 people uh, who otherwise would have been killed in terrorist attacks. Um, during that time, as I said, about 44 <laughs> people were murdered in foreign-born terrorist attacks on U.S. soil. So unless you think counterterrorism spending is 99.95% effective at deterring deaths, you have to conclude we're overspending on counterterrorism. <laughs> yeah, by a lot. Yeah, yeah. I remember. I mean, uh, the there was some some report by Cato that looked at uh, the efficacy of the war on terror, and in countries that where the U.S. launched a war on terror, like terrorism went up like two thousand percent, and then in other similar countries that were similar, except that we hadn't launched the war on terror and went up like forty percent. So it seems like, you know, the, the many, tri the $8 trillion or something that we spent on the war on terror brought us more terrorism um, and also killed, you know, several million people um, and displaced tens of millions. Yeah. Um, so I guess what the, the kind of, the kind of last, the last story and, um, uh, or one, one final worry that, that people might have about immigration as they say, you know, the, the, the trek to the United States for a lot of immigrants is very harrowing, you know, uh, some huge portion of people who try to immigrate here are sexually assaulted. Some huge portion of women who immigrate here are sexually assaulted. You know, it's, it's, uh, you know, there, a lot of them are subject to violence. So, you know, why should we, why should we be allowing people to immigrate if it's causing, uh, so much harm when they, when they immigrate here? Yeah, the, um, there is a lot of harm. Those harms are caused by immigration restrictions. People walk through the desert 
and hire human smugglers for tens of thousands of dollars because they can't buy a plane ticket or take a bus here. And so if we're actually worried, if policymakers were actually worried or concerned with the harm that migrants undergo by trying to come to the United States illegally, um, their goal would be to legalize immigration so that people don't have to hire human smugglers um, so that they can just buy a plane ticket in the same way that you and I can buy a plane ticket to, you know, travel to Ohio. Well, you know, for if we wanted to, right? These people can't do that. So they have to hire a smuggler. So if we made it so that they can buy a plane ticket to come to Ohio, they don't have to hire a human smuggler. They don't have to have, they have a much lower chance of being raped, of being assaulted, of being murdered, of undergoing all these harms. And, um, you know, the, the argument on the other side, of course, is, well, you know, uh, immigration is just a giant subsidy for cartels and these other horrible criminals. And I say immigration restrictions are a subsidy for cartels and horrible criminals. And if you want to defund cartels, you legalize as much as you can the things that they smuggle. So you legalize drugs, you legalize weapons, and you legalize um, immigration. And you destroy these black markets and you defund uh, cartels and you defund criminals and you make it so that these poor migrants uh, don't have to suffer along the way, except by you know bad customer service in an airline. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, so now, now you know it's been established. We, you know, all all the objections to immigration have been have been decisively refuted. It's been uh, convincingly established that immigration is good. I'm sure you know now everyone in the world will now all be pro-immigration after after listening to this podcast. Um, yeah, Alex. Uh, thanks. Thanks so much for coming on. Uh, I'll I'll link to your Substack below. You know, very very worth reading. Lots of interesting articles. Yeah. Thanks so much. Well, thank you very much for having me. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, all right.